Hi, and welcome back to the inside of my head, where I finally got eyes on GSP, Godzilla's singular point, which gives us a whole new look for the Godzilla franchise. And there's definitely some elements that are pretty different in here. But is different a bad thing? Beat that subscribe button. Let's find out. Considering that most of us watch these movies and series mostly for the kaiju, let's face it. Actually, I watch it to examine whether the line between pop culture and traditional culture is blurring, perhaps to one day disappear altogether. Get the fuck out of here. Any redesign is going to be a talking point, so let's get that out of the way first. Now, because Toho has handed the making of this show to Studio Orange and the monster design to Studio Ghibli's E.G. Yamamori, we are definitely going to get a drastically different flavor of noodle to what we've been used to. In some cases, at least. The redesign is most notable with Rodan, who's now pretty much just a pterodactyl. Jet Jaguar has a distinctively more homemade and cobbled together in the backyard kind of feel. Whoa, easy fella. Angurus always kind of did look slightly dinosaur-like, but now has a lot more spikes, which we're going to talk about later because they're important at one point. Manda is still a giant sea serpent, but now there are flocks of them. Kamonga is a lot brighter colored than he used to be, and now is a lot smaller, and now there are swarms of them. And you know what? I'm still not 100% sure that this is supposed to be Kamonga. If you look, he's got these kind of drill hands like Megalon has. So maybe it's a hybrid of the two. I honestly do not know. And this apparently is Gabara from All Monsters Attack. But they've renamed him Salunga. To me, renaming one of these monsters is not the end of the world. I just kind of don't really understand why they did it. They might as well have just come up with a new monster. But let's talk about the big man himself. Now, as in Shin Godzilla, he has different forms. The first one that we see is Godzilla Aquatilus. And here you can see him jumping out of the ocean and he looks kind of like a pink Mosasaurus. His second form is Godzilla Amphibia. And like Aquatilus, you don't really see that much of it. Then he turns into this, which is Godzilla Terrestris, which from certain angles looks like he's got a snake's head. He's got this big sort of wide smile and these eyes that point in opposite directions. And, and, and although considering where I'm at in the series, I haven't yet seen his final form, I definitely have my reservations. Reservation for two, sir? Just one. So while I was initially a little put off by these new designs, it occurred to me that weird and wonderful creature designs have always been part of the charm in this franchise. You just have to get into the right mindset. And as well as that, the fact that one large thread in this plot deals with time divergence and the past, the present, and the future all melding together, and time reversal and things like that, the fact that these creatures look a lot more dinosaur-like might make a certain kind of sense. So let's talk about the plot. Let's talk about the plot. Boop, 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 boop. As with many of the Toho Godzilla movies that, that I've seen at least, the fuck you about to say? It's pretty slow, at least at first. Mm, yeah, that's probably fair. If you're expecting wall-to-wall -wall monster fights and get annoyed by the amount of time spent on human characters, this is gonna be kind of hard work for you. And I have no reservations in admitting that at points, I really struggled with this. The plot is complicated and even a little convoluted. Con. Vo. Lu. And essentially centers on Yun and Mei, who are these two geniuses who try to solve this mystery of why these creatures covered in red sand are appearing and fucking shit up. And as such, the focus is really on those mystery elements. So it starts with Yun and his friend Barbell. At least I think his name is Barbell. Actually, it's not. It's totally not. His name is Habaru. <laughs> who work making industrial robots for their mad old pops for their company Otaki Factory, search for the source of some mysterious radio wave transmission, which eventually, in a roundabout way, leads to the apparition of a large pterodactyl, which they eventually name Rodan. After a brief fight with Jet Jaguar, which is the Otagi Factory Gang's side project, Rodan takes off into the air before inexplicably dying and crashing to the ground. Now, if that's not weird, my name ain't Shirley Temple. Your name ain't Shirley Temple, though. I know! That's the entire point of the... That's the way the allegory... That's... Uh. This episode ends with the reveal of a big Godzilla skeleton. At least we think it's Godzilla. We're not sure. Back at the Otaki factory warehouse, this goth chick tells Yun, Barbell and Pops there will be more of these flying fuckers, according to a local legend called the Deception of the Gajira, and when the sea is stained red, the beast of end times will emerge from the boundary. You guys with me so far? Not too complicated yet, right? Anyway, that's exactly what happens, because this ep ends with these fishermen witnessing a whole swarm of pterodactyls, I mean Rodans, coming out of a reddened sea, just as prophesied. 
Episode 3 starts with the military launching F-35 to intercept the pterodactyls, I mean Rodans, which have changed in form. Now, they're smaller than the original one and number in the tens of thousands. The Otaki guys draw the Rodans away using their moped called a gyro, which can broadcast this radio signal that attracts them. And just like before, they inexplicably start dropping down dead. Now already in my plot recap, I feel like I'm putting more emphasis on the monsters than is actually in the series itself. Anyway, they discover a red sand on the Rodans, which is also found on the Godzilla skeleton. Now this red sand is pretty important because it ties together the entire plot. But let's come back to that. In Ep 4, we see a shadowy organization that has a missile silo-like tunnel deep into the earth. And guess what? Salunga's down there and is trying to get the fuck out. We see Angurus. And when hunters try to shoot him, he vibrates the spikes on his back and radiates all these vibrant colors, which feels like he's slowing down time, allowing him to ricochet the bullet away. Yun reckons it's because somehow this beast can see the future. So obviously there's something weird happening here with the concept of time. Rodan just suddenly drops down dead? Like he has a much shorter lifespan in our temporal reality? Or is that because they can't survive- <laughs> Fucking fuck fuck fuck. Or is that just because they can't survive outside the red dust for very long? And then Anguris can manipulate time somehow. On top of everything, there are Manda attacks, the mammoth class snake, which along with further Rodan attacks, start to create havoc with everyday life. But it's okay, because we've got Pops in Jet Jaguar. <laughs> Everything's gonna be fine, guys. Just as he's about to take on Angurus, it cuts, and that's the end of Ep 5. In Ep 6, we learn more about the mysterious Professor Ashahira and his studies of the Red Dust, and Jet Jaguar continues the fight with Angurus, and only manages to beat it by firing a harpoon at point-blank range, which by the show's logic, didn't give him enough time to see the future and block it. The other interesting thing is that Angurus has a chance to kill Jet Jaguar at one point, but doesn't, indicating that it's not naturally aggressive, it's just defending itself. But fret not Angurus fans, because he comes back to life just five minutes later and literally takes Jet Jaguar's head off. Godzilla Aquatilus chases some Mandas in the ocean before heading for the city and assuming his second form. And that is roughly the halfway point in this series. And so far, I'm really enjoying it. It's got that distinct wacky Japanese flavor that I love with the mad old pops and the sushi and the lanterns and the crazy game shows. That, by the way, is a cockroach. And the belly button festivals, and those last two aren't in it, but you know what I mean. The characters are pretty likable, which is good because you're going to be spending a lot of time with them. This show is pretty slow. There is no two ways about that, with May spending long passages of time talking to the AI cat on her laptop or having instant messaging sessions with Yun. And damn, these guys text fast. There are a lot of complicated scientific discussions that go back and forth, and I don't actually mind that. I've got no problem with the techno babble in Star Trek and all those other sci fi shows. They're with 25 bilateral kelolacterals. 25 bilateral kelolacterals! I used to understand the world, but this is way more dense and it doesn't link up particularly well. Could be a subtitling issue, could be a Japanese thing, or maybe I'm just too fucking dumb to keep up with it all. Apparently, one of the writers is a physicist. Guess where this chalk has been? That's right, son, up my butt or some other kind of brainiac scientist, I don't know. And if all this stuff turns out to be physically accurate, amazing. But you know what? It's drowning the pacing, guys. However, as I said earlier, if you can get yourself into the right mindset and accept the pacing for what it is, you'll definitely enjoy this. And luckily, I did. But I have a feeling that many people won't. But the main function of the first half of this show is clearly to set up all these mysteries surrounding the monster attacks. As I said earlier, if you're looking for monster fights, there just aren't any, at least in the first six apps anyway. Barring the Jet Jaguar fights with the pterodactyl, I mean Rodan, and Jet Jaguar versus Angurus. But it does slowly but surely start to build momentum as we progress, so let's hope that continues. Personally, I wish they would start connecting these mysteries together a little sooner, as, it, as the whole thing is pretty confusing to follow, which is probably not helped by the fact that I watched it in Japanese with subtitles, so I might have missed half of the plot for all I know. So going into the second half, there are still a lot of unanswered questions. What was the source of the mysterious song from the Haunted Mansion? What's the deal with Ashihara and the Red Dust? How did the Godzilla skeleton get in that basement? What the fuck is an orthogonal diagonalizer? <laughs> this guy doesn't know what an orthogonal diagonalizer is. What a moron. Who is this mysterious organization who have Salunga sealed in this tunnel? Make sure you get subscribed so that you don't miss my part two video, where I will try my very best 
to explain all this stuff. And as always, guys, I'm super grateful for you taking the time to watch my videos, and I will see you very soon for the next one. Thank you very much. Cheerio, bye!